as always, it comes down to facts and truth. Now, you present her with the facts, and I'm sure she will find her way back to the truth. I hear a lot of Christians say that the movie Case for Christ is undeniably proven that Jesus resurrected from the dead and that it's the true religion. So I'm going to go through Case for Christ. I'm going to go through the book and the movie and go through all the questions and, re and review all the scholars that are in here and all the sources they have and show you how all of them are easily debunkable. Very, very, very easy debunkable. So here we go. Thinks I'm trying to assassinate Christianity. You sure you want to hand me that gun? I'm pretty sure you're not going to be able to pull the trigger. All right. Who's the big authority on the resurrection? Dr. Gary Habermas. Has he debated Anthony Flew? That guy's one of my heroes. He's in Wisconsin, by the way. Big debate this weekend. Okay, so th this Dr. Hermas is this supposed to be their PhD scholar, and he's their source for almost everything in this movie and in his book. He's where all their 39 sources come from. And what the, the way they use this dude as a source and how they use this, how do they explain all these things in the movie is should be criminal. But they, they, they're slick about it. The way they actually present it is that they 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 make it they do it in a way so they don't have to actually lie but they're lying and i'll show you what i mean in a second so first of all this guy right here they introduce him as somebody who debated an atheist one time and made him convert to christianity well the truth is he didn't convert after the debate it wasn't a debate it was a discussion and the guy switched from atheism to agnosticism three years earlier so he doesn't even correct him in his introduction, which is crazy, which tells you who we're dealing with. And then you can kind of hear by the way he talks, he's not that that bright. So he's an evangelical, got his PhD as a Christian, and he's just that's just that's just their guy. He's like their their scapegoat for sources and information. He can just say what he wants and people listen to him. And it's a shame because the, the people literally lie. They think that it's okay to lie as long as they're getting people good, getting people to have faith. It's not it's not that big of a deal, but you're still lying. So I'll show you right now how they're lying. Narrowed down a list of about 20 to a list of about 12. And then I tell them, everybody grants these, but I'm going to be more skeptical even than you. I say that sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I say, I only need six of them, just six. And these six real quickly are that Jesus died due to crucifixion. Secondly, his earliest followers had experiences that they believed were appearances of the risen Jesus. Thirdly, these experiences didn't take forever to be reported. I mean, sometimes critics criticize the gospel of Mark at 40 years later. 40 years is great in ancient history, but this goes back to the first days, months, or perhaps a year after the event itself, we have reports that go back that far. So you're saying that these are valid historical facts that even skeptics, atheists, agnostics will admit to that Jesus was crucified, that his followers had some experience they claim was a resurrection that changed their lives and that the reporting of that, because you know, you hear, oh, the, the, the New Testament was written hundreds of years after it's not reliable, but you're saying, no, there's, there's historical data that's reliable from within days of weeks of the resurrection? Sure, here's how you do it. Mark is plus 40 after the cross, which is great in ancient history. The earliest biography that we have of Alexander is Alexander the Great is almost 300 years later. And the best biographies of Alexander are 425 to 450, almost half a millennium. Mark at plus 40 is excellent. Now, so first he says that Alexander, it, there's no sources for his life for almost half a millennium. That's not, that's such a lie. It's not even funny. The literally the year he's alive, the years he's alive, there's sources mentioning him. The Opus, no, Opus Mutiny's one. There's inscriptions all over Asia about him and his army coming through in all these different languages, Persian, Indian, Greek, you, like 
Hebrew, the, the Bible literally wrote about him. He's written in Maccabees, which is in 200 BC. So that's demonstrably false, easily proven false. And then he talks about Mark being 40 years after. That's a long time, first of all. But second of all, we don't have any manuscripts of Mark in the first century. They're all from a 120 AD and later. Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't a Mark in 40 years after. It's just we just don't have it. So we can't use that. So we can't. he can't sit there and say that, on one hand, we don't have anything from Alexander for 300 years and then use that and then not use that same exact logic for mark and and you because there's some people mention that there's a mark 40 years after that he's going to use that but there's obviously mentions of alexander within the years he's alive so then you he, he he makes a double standard here this is what they do all the time they apply certain logic to things that they don't that they want to disprove and they don't use that exact, same exact logic for their own selves it, it's it's just it's it should be it should be criminal that these people get away with this stuff. This is a doctor with a PhD doing this. It, it's unbelievable that I, it's so easily catchable too. Something you like to ask me, Mr. Strobel? Yeah, well, I, 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 so I read your book and there's something that stuck out to me. How can anyone talk about historical evidence for the resurrection when the resurrection by nature is a miracle? Right? We all know miracles can't be proven scientifically. Correct, but we don't have to prove a miracle to prove a resurrection. Okay, love to hear you explain that one. Yeah, I just have to show that Jesus died and he was seen afterwards. Right, but the very people who claim that they saw him are religious zealots. So in my line of work, we call those biased sources. Well, I'm not interested in bias either, Mr. Strobel. You see, I care about the facts for professional and, and personal reasons. Right, so where are the facts, Dr. Habermas? The resurrection narrative is more legend than it is history. Really? Well, not according to historical records. Did you know that we have a report of the resurrection with specific eyewitnesses that dates all the way back to within months of the resurrection itself? That source also adds that 500 separate people saw Jesus at the same time. We're not talking decades or centuries after the cross, Mr. Strobel. It's months. So here's where they get really criminal. So watch what they do here. They, he, he makes his claim, and then they're going to switch to another scene, and he's going to answer that question by by saying the source is the Bible itself. So that means there is no source. There is nothing. He doesn't say anything about a, a, a source being months away, 500 people. He's literally mentioning uh, an epistle in the Bible. Okay, so 500 witnesses, but that's still just one historical source. The Bible, just one historical source. The Bible. Wrong. There are at least nine ancient sources, both inside and outside the Bible, confirming that disciples and others encountered Jesus after the crucifixion. And using that as his source. And then you're going to hear the, the main character say, well, you're, he, they're going to they're gonna correct themselves. They're going to... So they're, they're going to say it so that if any any scholars are watching this, they can't call them liars because he even says, "Oh, your source is the Bible." You have, you have to catch it though. They do it so subtly. So then what he does is he says, "Oh, we have nine other sources outside of that. That's those are the nine sources that we have to focus on. Those are all from 110 A.D. and and to, to 300 A.D. None of them are in the first century except for one, Josephus." which I'm going to demonstrate why that is actually a forgery. So we have nothing, not one. Imagine if 9-11 happened and the media didn't say anything about it until the year 2090. That's literally what it's like. Exactly the same. Or imagine if, imagine if I said right now JFK is the Messiah, that JFK ro rose from the dead. And that the media just never talked about it. And you, if you don't know this, then you're just you're just, you're just uh, lost. You you should have known this by now. And I just make this claim, and there's nothing to prove it. And I just say it right now in the year 2021. That's exactly what's what happened in the first century. Now in the book, they get even more criminal because they take those 500 supposed eyewitnesses, which there's no sources of, and then assume that you think that those sources exist. And then go into to examine if they were hallucinating or not. So what they do is they change the subject and make you assume that this is proven that we have these 500 sources, which they don't. 
and then talk about that if they were hallucinating then they'd be they'd have different accounts but the, the point of the matter is they're changing the subject from the 500 sources that don't exist and making you think that and making you assume that they do exist and they're going to try to test out if there's hallucinations or not it's just like it's 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 criminal it literally is criminal there's just complete lying so now you're probably asking okay so what are these nine sources they're talking about well first i want to start with with who was around in the first century that was writing books encyclopedias and in-depth uh descriptions of what was happening in the first century you got pliny the elder who wrote an encyclopedia in Caesarea in in judea in the year 45 eight, or i think it was in the 40s or 50s a.d he has chapters written about prodigal births and people who are deified like the caesars never mentions that jesus once that's a big problem number two you got all these lists of all these historians from around this time not one of them mentions it the first actual mention and it's used in the sources by dr hermas is from the year 110 a.d and they only say Crestus or Christus. There's three sources for this. Suetonius, Tacitus, and Pliny the Younger. Which is interesting. And Josephus is actually the only one in the first century that mentions the word Jesus. And it was demonstrated to be a forgery. And there's many reasons why. One, because if Josephus mentions that this person died on the cross and was resurrected then he would have wrote a lot more about this person, not just one sentence that was slipped in, and it didn't even have anything to do with the context of the, what else he was talking about. Number two, Eusebius, the church historian, the church historian wrote about Josephus as a contemporary of Jesus, just like Philo, but he never ever mentions the testimonium Flavian, which is the sentence that was uh, demonstrated as a forgery. So we don't have a single source of the mention of the word Jesus until the second century. And even if you want to give, and, and I hate, I hate mentioning that Josephus is a forgery because all it does is make Christians think, oh, they're just trying to disprove us. They just want to make us seem like he obviously did say it. I'll even give you Josephus. I'll even give you Josephus. Ninety-five A.D. That's two, two. That's two generations away from the supposed time of jesus that means that's literally the same thing as saying jfk is the messiah and jfk rose from the dead right now it doesn't make any sense it doesn't make any sense logically this is a myth but but they were already followers of jesus well not all of them think of saul of tarsus he originally was a persecutor of christians he hunted them down and killed them yet he died the apostle paul proclaiming that Jesus was the son of God. But, but let's not kid ourselves here. People die for lies all the time. 900 people died drinking poison Kool-Aid at Jonestown. True, and there are other examples like that throughout history, but here's the difference. People don't willingly drink poison for something that they know is a lie. I always fall back into Paul and Tarsus and all these characters that are, used, that are talked about in the Bible with no historical data and just going to use the Bible to prove the Bible. And this is what always happens. It just, it's a big circle and it never ends. The rest of the movie is basically like this, but I'll, I'll keep you going for a couple more um, examples of bullshit. In fact, speaking of Paul of Tarsus, uh, he, in, in the book of Acts, there's very specific things about Paul that should be easily proven. Like for example, trying to track down where Alexander of the great went very easily and it's very it's quickly found all of his uh his trails are easily found for 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 paul though he, i mean he the, the bible claims that he appealed to caesar and then went in front of agrippa there should be tons of tons of historical evidence for that there's not even a shred in fact there's not even anything that shows that paul even existed he could be a code for josephus for all we know it could be he could be someone else we don't even know. We have no idea. There's not even anything that... He's a Roman citizen, supposedly. A dual citizen. There's nothing to even show for him being alive except for his, his epistles. Who knows if he wrote the epistles? We don't even know that. We can't prove any of that. A number of people claim to have seen Jesus after his crucifixion, and some of them even wrote it down. But I guess my question is, how, how can we be sure 
or the reliability of those manuscripts. Well, the same way we authenticate any historical document, by comparing and contrasting the copies that have been recovered. It's called textual criticism. The more copies we have, the better that we can cross-reference and figure out if what the original was saying is historically accurate. And the earlier they come from in history, the better. Take Homer's Iliad, for example. Hmm? Is this real? That's as real as the Macedonian dirt that I dug it up from. Well, the Greeks considered this their Bible for many centuries. Yes, they did. That is one of 1,565 copies in existence today. Now, the Iliad was originally composed 800 years before Christ. Okay. This Greek copy is dated at the third century AD. So, 800 and so, so that's, that's 1,100 years between this copy and the original, yes? Correct. There is only one ancient collection of writings that has more authenticated copies than the Iliad. Can you guess what that is? You're gonna tell me the Bible. The New Testament. And how many copies is that? To date, archaeologists have recovered 5,843 Greek New Testament manuscripts. That's four times as many as the Iliad. Really? The earliest fragment of the Gospel of John was found in ancient Egypt, and it dates to 2nd century AD. How close is that to the original? Less than 30 years. I have one of the fragments in my collection. It's quite a treasure, isn't it? Oh. After the New Testament and the Iliad, the runners-up don't even come close. We only have 100 copies of Sophocles, seven copies of Plato's Tetralogies, and only five copies of anything by Aristotle. In fact, if you laid the surviving copies of Aristotle, one on top of the other, they would make barely four feet. You do the same with surviving copies of the New Testament, the stack would be a mile high. Nothing else in history even comes close. How is that for reliable? So this is where you separate the low IQ people from the normal IQ people. Because they throw words around like textual criticism as if this is like some slam dunk evidence right here. And they even use an example of a myth such as the Iliad to show that textual criticism matters and if there's more textual criticism that makes it more legit which doesn't mean that at all because all that means is there was one source and people wanted to make copies of that one source doesn't say anything about that source at all so this is completely nonsense I, it, it, it's funny to me how people think this is like one of the one of their biggest slam dunk evidence for for um for this being true but if anything, I mean, propaganda gets copied. People don't want to change. You don't change propaganda. If this was true eyewitness accounts, there'd be multiple different ones, not just one source of a, of a million different copies of one source. It actually proves otherwise. It actually makes it look more like a myth. Dr. Waters. Ah, hello, Mrs. Strobel. As much as I would like to help a fellow skeptic, what you're proposing is completely impossible. But how can you say that? I mean, if Charles Manson can turn his followers into murderous zombies, surely the followers of the Christ cult could be convinced of their own delusions? Listen, hallucinations are like dreams. They happen in individual minds. They don't spread like the common cold. Okay, so a hypnotist turns a stage full of insurance salesmen into, into clucking chickens. Then that's, that's not really happening, or...? No, of course it is. The power of suggestion can be very profound, but it's one thing to be mesmerized into making animal noises. It's quite another for 500 people to have the same dream. To be honest, that would be an even bigger miracle than the resurrection itself. And without an empty tomb, you and I, we're not even having this conversation. If Jesus recovered from his injuries, that solves that problem. All these people could have easily seen him, yes? Yes, but I'm afraid that's not a brain issue. You need to speak to a medical doctor. Of course. Dr. Waters, again, thank you for your time. You've been most gracious. 
But before you go, may I ask you something? Sure. It's about your father. I'm just curious what your relationship with him is like. <laughs> um, complicated. Let me guess. Distant, cold, doesn't give much affirmation or express love. Guilty on all charges. Why? I imagine as a skeptic, you're familiar with history's great names in atheism. Hume, Nietzsche, Sartre, Freud. Of course, yes, some of my greatest heroes. Did you know that all of them had a father who either died when they were young, abandoned them, or was physically or emotionally abusive? In the world of therapy, it's called a father wound. Here's when I start to lose patience because they name all these scientists and psychologists and psychiatrists from the turn of the century, from the Enlightenment era, like Jung and Freud, people who actually like really broke down Christianity for what it is. And instead of instead of trying to debunk their arguments, they just make a claim that all of them had daddy issues. It's like, what? And, and people actually eat, eat this up. And, Amen. Amen. It's crazy. It, it, literally, it literally is insanity in America. My asphyxiation. Come with me. The stress on Jesus' chest muscles would have locked his lungs into the inhale position. Right? So in order to let the breath out, he would have had to shove himself up using his spiked wrists and feet, scraping his shredded back against the wood of the cross, and then sagged back down again in order to draw his next breath, which he would have had to have done over and over and over again, until utter exhaustion just made it impossible. And then inevitably, he dies uh, in, in theory, but let's, let's remember, these soldiers, they're not doctors, okay? So maybe, uh, maybe they took him off the cross and they, they thought he was dead, but in fact he wasn't. No, of course they weren't medical doctors, they were professional killers, right? And they were quite good at their jobs. They, they had to be. If a prisoner escaped alive, they themselves would be executed. Now, Mr. Strobel, the crucifixion of Jesus is one of the best attested events in the ancient world. And, if you will, the final nail in the coffin, <laughs> the swoon theory, is this. When the soldiers thrust their spear between Jesus' ribs, do you know what came out? Blood and water, which we now know is a description of pericardial effusion as a result of death by asphyxiation. This is not a condition anyone could fake. And so to answer your question, yes, it is my medical opinion. This is pretty much all I could stomach with this movie. They go to a medical doctor in modern times and then use the Bible again. No, no outside of the Bible evidence, just just what it says in the in the myth and then use that as evidence that this person died on the cross I, so that's like me saying aesop fable well it says here the wolf blew on the house so if the house really did get blown on by a wolf it, the wolf the house definitely could have fell down it's the same exact thing it just it's it's and here here's all these american christians amen amen Imagine a college-educated American not knowing when a preacher's lying to him. 